Yeah, so just to recap for, for this meeting, we're going over different papers that will uh, cover kind of doing LLM automated evals. Um, and the paper, this one right now is Ragus, and it's looking at just like using static prompts to and uh, kind of a open AI another model in order to evaluate kind of the output of RAG systems. Um, and the paper that we are going to be reading, um, the focus of this meeting is on, um, is is the paper called Luna, which actually trains its own um, Deberta model, so a smaller 440 um, million model that is able to essentially um, that is able to essentially just figure out like what the spans and long context um, documents that were hallucinated versus not. So yeah, before we talk about that, was just going over over Ragus in a little bit more detail because this is generally the current framework that most people use. Um, so yeah, so they kind of have these different um, prompts and kind of um, scores in order to generate these few metrics. So as I mentioned, the first one is faithfulness. Um, so it says that the answer is faithful to the context Q if the claims that are made and the answer can be inferred from the context. So to estimate faithfulness, we first use an LLM to extract a set of statements. Um, the aim of this step is to decompose longer sentences into shorter, more focused assertions. Um, yeah, so given a question and an answer, create one or more statements from each sentence in the given answer. Um, where question and answer refer to the given question and answer. For each statement, um, the LLM determines if S of I can be inferred from CQ using a verification function. The verification step is carried out through this prompt. So essentially, it's just like taking the response, um, breaking it down into all of the different facts that are included in that, and then given the, um, and then it's trying to figure out, yeah, if, if each of the statements can be verified using the context. So yeah, consider the given context and following statements and determine whether it's supported by the information present in the context, provide a brief explanation, yes or no, provide a final wow. verdict for each statement in order to, um, in order, do not deviate from the specified format. Um, final faithfulness for F is this com then computed as B, the number of statements that were supported and the total number of statements. Have, have any of you guys used Dragos before, by the way? Uh, maybe not. Yeah, I don't know. So I, I've been using this with um, Linksmith for a little bit. And yeah, it essentially just does exactly what it's saying. It comes up with five or six statements. It gives you a one or zero score if the context supports it. So just kind of saying like, hey, is your LLM making stuff up after retrieving the documents? Um, so maybe it retrieved a document that said Obama's president. And then it in the actual final output, it said um, Obama was president in like, 1970 or something so that like extra information is not supported from from the documents um and then the other metric they use is answer relevance so we say that an answer is relevant if it directly addresses the question in an appropriate way um in particular our assessment of relevance does not take into account factuality but penalizes cases where the answer is incomplete or contains redundant information um yeah so it's just saying like, is this tangential? Is this, how related is this to the question? Like, so if you ask our, our cats mammals and it answers something about dogs, it'll say false. Um, yeah, so it's, it's essentially this is just like backward tracking, right? So given, um, given the answer generates a question and it sees how similar the question is with the original question. We obtain the embeddings for all questions using the ADA, ADA model available from OpenAI. For each question, we calculate the similarity with the original question and the cosine similarity between the corresponding embeddings. The answer relevance score, AR, for the question is this computed as sum of all of the similarity scores. Um, cool, okay. And then the last one they mentioned is context relevance. So the context um, CFQ is considered relevant to the extent that it exclusively contains information that is needed to answer the questions. In particular, this metric aims to penalize the uh, inclusion of redundant information to estimate context relevance given a question Q and its context C of Q. The LLM extracts a set of subset of sentences. 
subset of sentences um, from CFQ that are crucial to answer Q using the following prompt, right? Please extract relevant sentence from the provided content context that can potentially help answer the following question. If no relevant sentences are found, or if you believe the question cannot be answered, return insufficient information. Um, while extracting candidate sentences, you're not allowed to make any changes to sentences from given context. So yeah, it's number of extracted sentences over total number. Um, so this is more of like a recall score, right? Like how many of everything you got, how much is actually relevant versus how much like uh, irrelevant context did you retrieve? Um, yeah, so this this is kind of, as mentioned, kind of, uh, it's been pretty popular over the last year, I would say. Um, it's a startup now that's trying to do this evals. And they the main thing, though, is that you can use these prompts or this kind of scoring approach with with um, any model. So it's kind of model agnostic. The kind of, obviously the um, the performance of this will like really depend on the model because I think as you guys have probably seen or heard, GPT models favor GPT answers, Claude models favor Claude answers and so forth. Um, sorry. Um, but yeah, so this is this is kind of one of the approaches that this, this um, uh, the paper, the current paper we're going to read is kind of benchmarking off of, and it says the main, even though this is good in terms of like how it takes the, um, how it takes the question and the context in order to generate the answer, it has the drawbacks in terms of, of the model, like one being as expensive as the actual generation, right? Because you're essentially just making two open AI GPT-4, two open AI GPT, actually three calls, right? For each of these, you're evaluating it. Um, so yeah, it becomes much more expensive. Um, any questions about Ragus or we can go back to the Luna paper? Okay. Um, sounds good. So for, for this one, um, as mentioned, they they met they mention uh, so that as I said, right, the main thing is that these the current challenges with these uh, eval models are one that they are pretty expensive. They uh, really depend and fluctuate based off of which model you're using. Um, they're pretty high latency. Um, yeah. So, but they this this paper says that they demonstrate that Luna outperforms GPT three point five um, and commercial evaluation frameworks on hallucination detection with. 97% um, reduction in cost and 91% um, reduction in latency. So what they did is they trained this DeBerta large model, so some 440 million parameter model um, on a really large corpus of, of RAG data sets and tried to, um, so that way it's kind of generalized across a lot of different uh, types of data. Um, you can see at the bottom that they talk about that in a little more detail. Um, yeah, they've essentially trained in all these different domains, right? Um, so customer support, finance, biomedical research, legal, general knowledge. Um, and RAG context and questions are sourced from open book QA data sets that cover these different domains. Um, yeah. And RAG responses are generated with GPT 3.5 and Cloud I2 and annotated with 4 Turbo. And hallucination indicates a fraction of hallucinated responses in each domain. Um, okay, so yeah, so that being said, I think this is an interesting thing. This is what I kind of, we can go through the paper kind of slowly, but I um, just wanted to mention. So one of the things that this is mentioning, right, is so this this fact is right, right? Washington, D.C., the capital of the U.S., was founded in 1791. But one other challenge that this paper is tackling is essentially once you chunk the entire article into a lot of different sections, right, um, if, if your retriever only retrieves a um, few different sections, it's going to uh, come up with a different metric on the, per the percentage of hallucination, right? So in naive context chunking, it leads to hallucination, false positives when supporting information is scattered throughout the text and without insights on which specific spans were supported, not supported by the context, it's impossible to arrive at a cor cor correct conclusion that the response in this example does not co contain hallucinations. Um, so yeah, this here we we can come back to this, but um, 
yeah, so those are some of the challenges. One is the, the latency, the cost, um, kind of maintaining systematic um, eval across different types of models. And then also trying to identify once you do all of this chunking, if you're both retrieving the right chunks, as well as once you've retrieved those chunks, being able to generate the right response. Um, okay, cool. So how this works is, um, yeah, we went over most of the other options. So these are some of the other things kind of that you might've heard of. Ragus is the one we just talked about. 3.5 chain, chain pole and true lens are um, other true lens also wrote up a paper that they compare this against called eras which um essentially does does this uh training here we can go through that um yeah our approach is closest to the concurrently proposed aries automated raggy balistrate framework with a few key differences so aries um essentially let's see where it talks about that um they also fine-tune on yeah, or fine tuning on in-domain data. So they, it's kind of essentially, um, you have a fine tuned model and you ask it how to answer questions and you compare it against your RAG system and um, see how well it does. So that's kind of what Aries is doing. Um, but the biggest challenge there is that if you want to actually use that for for, for live production systems, you need to be uh, tuning this, this model for every one of your domains. Um, and as it changes, it, it won't really keep up. So um, yeah, so what they're looking to do essentially is try to create a um, fine-tuned bird models for, for this. And yeah, that's what this is. Um, it's a lightweight rag hallucination detection model that generalizes across different industries. Um, it's a 440 parameter to bird a large encoder that is fine-tuned on carefully curated real-world rag data. From analysis of RAG and production settings, we identify long context RAG evaluation as a previously unaddressed challenge and propose a novel solution that facilitates high precision, long context RAG hallucination detection. Um, cool. Yeah. And then the main difference is against this kind of um, in domain fine tuning approach called ARIES is um, ARIES requires a validation set of in domain data to fine tune a custom evaluation model while Luna is pre-trained on a cross-domain corpus. Um, and then Luna also does um, kind of span detection, as we'll see in a few minutes. It try to, tries to identify the start and end of each hallucination instead of just giving a Boolean response on this is a hallucin hallucination or not. And Luna is optimized to process up to 16K tokens um, on deployment hardware. So yeah, as mentioned before, when we're looking through that Ragus paper, um, they kind of have this concept of trying to identify what is supported tokens in response given a query and the retrieved context. Um, so framing this paper allows it to kind of be similar to this faithfulness metric that we just mentioned, um, which is of the context provided, how much is that actually being supported by the context um, in, in the answer generated, right? Um, so yeah, they aim to identify hallucinated spans in the response rather than just doing a, a boolean of yes or no. And while predicting spans is a more challenging approach, it actually kind of allows you to to do it for for long form context where um, you can actually try to retrieve the right chunks and figure out if there's a hallucination is much harder. Um, okay, so now the next part that they talk about is like how they handle the chunking approach, right? So um in sync consider a single input into the rag evaluation model that consists of tokens uh question tokens and a response uh so this is just yeah as i said like you fetch relevant context and then you have a question and you generate a response if you're working um with the evaluator model that accepts maximum sequence length of l um, but the context is much larger right so this is the general thing like how to break it up into windows such that each window contains the question response and a subset of the context tokens. Um, so that's kind of what they're saying here is this is a window. It's a concatenation of some amount of context, the question, and then the responses. Um, and there are NL windows, for example. Um, in figure three, there are three such windows. Our model outputs support probabilities for each of the response tokens in W. Uh, we train with the cross entropy loss on each token output during training we leverage granular token level support labels 
to adjust the training labels in each batch based on which context tokens are present in the window. Um, so yeah, this is going back to what we were mentioning before, right? So here um, in figure three, Washington DC, the capital of US is supported in window one. Nothing is supported in window two and was founded in 1971 is supported in window three. Um, so these are the three contexts, right? One, two, three. Um, they're trying to figure out like which um, which of these are supporting. So this is, yeah. Um, at inference, we aggregate example level support probabilities by taking the, to taking the token level maximum over windows. Um, example level support probability for token J is defined as um, the max of like, yeah, over all the windows of the probability of that window actually supporting the final response. Um, to pr produce an example level level label, we take the minimum over our tokens so that the overall probability, support probability is no greater than the support probability of the least supported token in the response. And then finally, the drive the example hallucination probability as P hallucination is one minus the probability of support. Um, any questions on this? I think this is like the main main part of the paper. No questions? Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, then they go into training, right? So to leverage this, what they do is they essentially create this data set to um, train the model across three epochs with cross entity among the loss of each response token initialize the learning rate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then they do this on these these different types of RAG data sets. Um, so there is, as I mentioned, customer support, finance, research, legal, general knowledge. Um, for each component data set, they essentially reserve some amount for validation. Um, and then they, they, they split it into each of these different contexts and kind of compute the score and then train it to be able to identify beforehand which of these are um, supporting versus non-supporting contexts. So this shows their kind of evaluation on each of these different approaches, right? So um, GPT 3.5 prompts, self-check GPT, um, fine-tuned LAMA, um, chain poll Ragus, groundedness and then Luna. Um, and they do it for each of these different types of question um, question formats and RAG, right? So question answering, data to text writing and summarization. Um, and yeah, response level results on the RAG truth hallucination prediction task. Um, Luna is compared against RAG truth baselines um, as well as our own baselines. Ragus and Freelens are Evaluation frameworks that query GPT 3.5 Turbo for hallucination detection. Chainpole is the um, ensemble prompt baseline. And their probability th thresholds are tuned for best overall F1. Um, the top are bolded and underlined. Luna outperforms all prompt based approaches and narrows the gap between other baselines and the fine tuned llama at a fraction of the cost. So, yeah, so fine tuning is essentially like in domain. So it has more or less is almost guaranteed to perform better because you're taking the data set and you're fine tuning a model on it. Whereas this is attempting to be kind of just a generic um, pre-trained like foundation model that's trained on all these different types of corpuses. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what they are looking for. Um,
And then the rest of this paper is really just going through uh, how they kind of, the main thing, right, is if you're using, um, if you're essentially using this much smaller uh, bird-based model, like you're going to get massive savings in latency and, uh, and cost. So as compared to all of these other approaches are essentially all using um, OpenAI 3.5 Turbo, um, except for the fine tuning, obviously. But yeah, so each of these are using Turbo and they're showing that by using the much smaller kind of Duberta model, they're able to get higher performance by using this kind of approach for training the model to identify what's hallucination versus not. Um, yeah. So essentially what they do is they, as I said, we can go over this one more time because I think it's like the most interesting thing that they did is just being able to um, chunk it into various different windows and then uh, predict the probability of each chunk actually being a support for the final response. Um, and then they do that token level. So as you can see here, um, for each token, they've actually predicted a score on if it's, actually, if it's supporting the response or not. Um, so yeah, so for from, from section two, right? Almost none of Washington DC was named for George Washington, president of the United States. None of that actually supports the final response. So all of that is has very low support scores. Um, but then the probability supported from this first section, which tells you um, it's the capital um, of the US, federal district, et cetera, that's directly in the response. So it has um, much higher kind of support scores for the first one. And then for the second, for the third one, it, it gives you much higher support scores for the when it was founded. So by this, they're able to essentially identify um, exactly what parts of the, the input kind of the context is directly supporting various different parts of the output text. And they're doing that on a, on a token by token level um, for each of the different contexts. Um, and then the overall supported score is going to be, yeah, the max of all of this. So you could say that, okay, this one chunk supported it with a very high probability, none of the other chunks did. So you take the max and then, um, yeah. And then the probability of hallucination is one minus the min of this. So um, yeah, I think the min of this is 0.8. So they say that the probability of hallucination is 0.2. I don't know. I think it's kind of clever. Clever, obviously. Like I don't. This is the first model I've seen that essentially is is kind of training a hallucination detection model. The rest are all using prompts, as we saw. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's pretty neat. Um, yeah, that's the main thing. As I mentioned, after that, they just train it, and then they're evaluating it on all these different data sets and trying to compare performance of theirs versus like the prompt based approaches. Um, yeah, we can go over this in a little more detail. So to leverage the full pre-trained natural language inference model, we initialized the hallucination prediction head with weights from an NLI classification layer. The original NLI head is a three class single layer perceptron. Um, during training, we optimized for low entailment probability. So um, yeah, NLI is essentially, I guess there's three different tasks um, for, for what they're saying is entailment, um, I think contradiction and support. So yeah, they use that kind of a model. Um, at inference, we output the probability of entailment for each token. So entailment is the same as support. Like does one, does the input lead to the output? Um, we apply data transformation techniques to introduce additional variability for better generalization during training. Transformations include dropping and inserting context documents and shuffling questions and responses between examples and batch. Training labels are adjusted accordingly with each transformation. Um, yeah, any, any questions on this? I think one of the things that I'm a bit, uh, curious about is how well they're able to, um, cause individual questions and individual words can be kind of hard to predict, right? Like, um, yeah, if you just think about tokens, right, there can be a lot of filler tokens. There can be a lot of words that just simply don't have, um, kind of context and if you're taking the minimum of all of them 
if even like one or two words aren't supported, it seems like there could add a lot of um, potential bias. But yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. This for it's like for this one example, it, it seems to be good. But if you think about, I haven't tried it out in, in, in production yet. But just based off of what they're claiming, it seems like yeah, it seems like it could be weird because there could be a lot of um, input statements that have you know a few words that aren't supported and then if you're taking the minimum of all the support scores um and if you're doing it on a token by token level it's not necessarily claiming a fact it's claiming more like is each individual word supported um i don't know it seems like a potential but i don't know it seems to have worked so maybe that's not really a concern but that's just one thing that kind of bothered me a little bit while i was reading this um cool is there anything else you guys want to discuss about this paper um yeah this is not open source it's i think it's i'm pretty sure it's like um part of the galileo framework so if you want to use it you need to pay for galileo but um yeah i don't know the the in theory it sounds pretty interesting and there'll probably be more and more more models that now come out that try to use a similar approach to um see how much of how much of the context is is directly supported by the response and then based on that um giving you a score the the other thing the other kind of drawback of this model is it's not able to uh, measure the other two scores right so it only does as we saw in, in uh in the ragus paper there's also context relevance um and accuracy and both of those scores aren't really being addressed by this metric. All this is really doing is trying to say like, um, for all of the different, for each of the things in the context, how closely is the fetched context tied to the generated answer? Um, but yeah, it still doesn't really um, take into consideration if you actually fetch the right context in the beginning. And also the other metric of like, did you fetch a lot of extra context that's not actually relevant to your answer? Um, so yeah, I think those are two other potential drawbacks with the solution. Um, okay, that's all I had. Um, if you guys, yeah, do you have do you have any other questions or things you want to cover in this evaluation space? Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, cool. I mean, this this is the main thing. As I said, like, um, I've used Dragus. I think it's pretty good. But I think the main challenge is if you use it, you do need to use like Mistral or some other cheaper model, or it gets your your kind of rag becomes three times more expensive as it was before because you're running like these three evaluation calls for everything. But um, yeah, I was. I haven't tried this out yet. I just saw the paper and thought it would be an interesting read.